Hello folks, Felix here from Heinrich Heine University Düsseldorf. In this video series we are going to talk about open science in the field of neuroscience and psychology. The series consists of three parts. In the first part we have been talking about all the problems in conventional science and our motivation to engage with open science. In the second part we have been talking about practical measures which we can take as individuals and as a community to make science open. In this video we are going to address some caveats of open science and take a more critical perspective. Part 3. Caveats of open science. In the last video we have been talking about preprints. Preprints are independently published manuscripts on open servers like Archive and the Open Science Framework. Preprints are typically not peer-reviewed but can be cited in other preprints and papers and they are usually searchable on Google Scholar. Similar to conference posters, the target group of preprints are usually other scientists with the goal of a fast and open exchange. However, also journalists are trawling preprint servers searching for the most recent developments. Journalists, however, without sufficient scientific education might struggle to evaluate the quality of preprints. This could, and in some cases has, led to the premature and overconfident communication of results. For example, the contemporary COVID-19 pandemic has led to a surge of published research and preprints, of which many do not live up to the necessary standards. This so-called speed science is a threat to evidence-based progress in the matter, as well as scientific integrity in the public reception. There are also concerns with pre-registration. Pre-registrations are pre-commitments to a research design or aspects thereof. They are typically created before data collection. Pre-registrations are supposed to fix statistical problems of unreported multiple testing and to clearly distinguish between confirmatory and exploratory research. However, pre-registrations cannot fix bad theory. If the statistical models we use are inadequate and do not map to the underlying theory, their predictive performance is not informative for scientific inference. While pre-registrations can increase our confidence in the predictive performance of theories, this is insufficient to validate an explanation. Vice versa, post-hoc inference can still be valid if performed rigorously. That is, a theory which was proposed after data collection can be used to derive further predictions which can be tested on the same data. Further, the assessment of the structural integrity of a theory is independent of the data. Following this notion, only hard to vary theories are useful, that is, theories which cannot be easily adapted to explain everything. The general line of this argument is that building theories is hard and underappreciated. Pre-registrations are not fixing this problem. It should be noted though that this does not take away from the increased transparency in research created by pre-registrations. It should be relatively unsurprising that there are also concerns with publicly sharing data. The most intuitive concern here is data protection. For example, using state-of-the-art face recognition software, it is possible to re-identify people from their cranial MRI data. Further, parts of the research community are concerned that open data sharing might lead to a disconnection of laboratory scientists who collect the data and external analysts. Such a disconnection is undesirable both because external analysts might have lacking understanding of the data, but also because it creates professional incentives against the laboratory career. In a worst case scenario, this could lead to the parasitic use of other researchers' data scooping away prospective publications. However, both of these problems can be fixed by promoting cooperation and collaboration instead of competition. A team of specialists is usually more productive than generalists trying to balance data collection and precise measurement with advanced analysis strategies. More than to sharing data per se, the previously outlined problems seem to be rather related to fair credit attribution among research teams. As public attention to the replication crisis increased, so did reactions to failed replication attempts of famous studies. A popular interpretation is that if a particular result cannot be replicated, that the underlying theory must be wrong. This is however usually a too far-fetched interpretation. To test theories and test their assumptions, we must make them accessible to experiments. Theoretical constructs must be translated into concrete measures. Besides central assumptions of a theory, this usually requires us to make additional auxiliary assumptions. For example, when conducting an experiment, we might assume negligence of experimenter and daytime effects, or a relevance of the resolution of the computer screen on which we present stimuli. Even under lab conditions, it is hardly ever possible to control for all of these implicit assumptions, which necessarily leads to variability in measurements and potentially also in replicability. The bottom line is that we should consider replication attempts as evidence for or against a given effect, model or theory, but they are rarely absolute falsifications. 
Another aspect to consider is that replicability is a low standard for research. Even if a given result replicates under very specific conditions, this is rarely the answer to the question which we are really interested in. Does this result also generalize to other conditions, perhaps outside the laboratory? Large resources are being spent on the replication of small effects and artificial paradigms. Is this even worthwhile or should we not spend our resources otherwise? Open science should not only be transparent, but also accessible. Accessibility, however, has recently been called into question. While I do not want to dive too deeply into this debate, there are some general takeaways which I think most people in open science will agree to. Open science should be inclusive, not an elitist insider culture. Rather than calling out violations of open science, we should strive for communication and get as many people on board as possible. Especially for early career researchers, it is usually not the will missing to engage in open science, but the possibilities as well as the support and information. To solve this problem, we should rather promote constructive approaches like free technical skills trainings. In summary, open science is a great development in research. However, as with everything, there are some caveats to consider. Preprints accelerate scientific communication, but might also circulate low quality output. Pre registrations, while contributing to scientific transparency, are no magic cure for all problems in scientific inference. When sharing data, we must be careful to respect data protection and ethical standards. The replication crisis is a severe problem, but it might be dwarfed by concerns of generalizability. Lastly, open science must also strive to be an open community. If you look for further information on open science, please consider the addresses shown on the screen. What are your thoughts on the caveats of open science? How can we deal with them? Do you have any further concerns which I did not mention in the video? Please let me know in the comments. At this point, I'd like to thank the great open science community on Twitter to provide me with helpful pointers and resources. Thanks for watching and see you soon.